New World by G.Q. Evans Read by Greg Haynes Prologue I am no one and everyone. I know that statement is very vague and broad, but is the most fitting of statements for a being such as I. I am no one and everyone, a face in the crowd that blurs into all the others, a stranger to be exact, which is fine by me. I prefer the status. It gives me an amount of anonymity that favors what I do. What is it that I do that you may ask? I observe people, places, events, stories, and such. It is a hobby of mine, and when you are a being who is unbound by the limits of space and time, you need lots of hobbies or go crazy. And I've been crazy, and it's not very fun. My identity and how I came to be in this peculiar situation of mine is unimportant at this time. What is important is the story that I'm about to t share with you. My status as an unbound being will give me more credence to the tale and its setting. Why is this important? Simple. Because what you are about to experience is beyond your understanding from the world that you live in. Please understand. When I say your world, I do not mean that this story takes place in some far-off alien planet in a distant galaxy. It occurs right here, Earth, third planet in the system of Sol, Milky Way galaxy. When I say your world, I mean the era in which you currently live in, commonly known in this era as the old world. Keep this in mind as I relate to you the facts that lead up to the story. The creation of the current era begins in the 20th century, uh, 2747 to be exact. I guess you could call it a golden age if that's what a golden age looks like. Humanity had reached a point in its history where it could be called a golden age, and with good reason too. Global relations between nations were such that mass scale wars were a thing of the past. Medical science had progressed to the point where crippling and deadly diseases were all but stamped out. Cybernetics and cryonics became viable fields of study. Economic problems were reduced to the lowest possible minimal levels. And the United States celebrated the election of its first Latino president, Isaac Alvarez, who started his term by annexing Puerto Rico and Cuba into the Union as the 51st and 52nd states, respectively. Truly, it was a good time to live on Earth. Now, in my observations of humanity and its various nations and cultures and countries and races, I have learned one thing. Humans are arrogant. Truthfully, humans have this almost genetic belief that they are the center of the universe and that everything they say and do is correct and right and perfect in the eyes of their God. They break themselves out of this e egotistical mindset via what I like to call hard lessons. At this time, they were going to learn another. November 2nd, 2047, just another day on this little blue marble in space. At least that's what they thought. On this night, an event would occur that would become yet another hard lesson for mankind and create a new era for the Earth. The moon exploded. This is what two million plus people who happened to be watching the skies at that night said happened when they were asked what they saw. The moon simply blew up. This proved a false assumption, however, as the moon did not truly explode, more like something hit the moon, causing a good part of it to blow off into millions of pieces. Two thirds of the moon was blown off in an instant. In under an hour, every space agency, dot com, and anyone with a telescope began to speculate as to about what happened. Some thought it was a rogue piece of space junk that hit it. Others say it was a rare convergence of space rays that happened once every million years or so. A few even suggested an errant nuke from Russia's space program from the days of the Cold War malfunctioned and launched to colliding with our nearest celestial neighbor. Even I, with my status, have not been able to ascertain the true cause of this event. All I've heard is rumor and theory. 
Needless to say, the resulting impact of this event was felt almost immediately. Global title changes happened almost overnight, with cities such as New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco finding themselves treading water. Large chunks of the moon that were blown off became a rain of death that pummeled the earth for seven days straight, destroying cities, killing millions, rendering most of the nations on earth into utter chaos, and changing the very land masses themselves forever. Skyfall. That is the name that this catastrophe would be known by in history. Now, I have no idea who came up with the term or where it originated from. It's just something that happened to appear one day in the books, newspapers, and documents over time. Not that I really care. It just fit what happened. Now, this was a hard lesson that would humble almost anyone else, but it was merely the first hard lesson that mankind would learn in the coming years. Three months after Skyfall, the reports began to surface in the greater United States. Reports of people who seemed stronger than most, who hated direct sunlight and who seemed to enjoy consuming blood, human blood. A few were captured and examined. They knew what these creatures were, but were unwilling to admit that they actually existed. The results of these examinations proved the old stories were true. Vampires. The ancient blood drinkers of European lore were indeed real and apparently living amongst them, blending in with humans for thousands of years. For a time, hunting these creatures was a way for, the, for humanity to cope, to take its mind off their ruined world, and these poor creatures became the focal point of their rage and hatred. Soon, however, as more and more vampires appeared in other nations, they began to realize that this wasn't just some random grouping or small gatherings of the night creatures. No, this was a nation, a nation of vampires. And they would be silent no longer. And they were not alone. The others had hidden themselves in the shadows of history and the veils of myth and legend, but now, in this ruined world, they would and could return. Lycans, the creatures of the hunt, driven by their loyalty to the pack, they are born hunters with the power to shift from beast to man at will. Elves, the immortal masters of magic, hidden in secret houses in the Antarctic. Elves prefer to keep to themselves rather than hide amongst the lesser humans. Dwarves, the diminutive race of craftsmen, living under the mountains, dwarves have been building cities of architectural genius since before humans learned to build straw huts. One by one these races emerged, and humans learned that their world, which they claim to be utter masters of, wasn't just reserved for them alone. Not anymore. And of course, they didn't exactly take this lightly. Thus we enter the chaotic century. Actually, it's more like 94 years, really, but a century just sounds better, I guess. This was a time of bitter conflict between the three top races, humans, vampires, and lichens, all three battling for what little remained of the world. For a long time, it was something of a stalemate with no one race coming out on top. That was until Firestorm hit. It was a virus, plain and simple, a deadly, virulent virus. It always seems to be mankind's, that mankind's greatest enemy has always been the smallest of organisms, always brought low by some disease, and it, this was no different. It came on suddenly and without warning, sweeping through the remaining human cities like a firestorm, hence the name. There was no cure or proper treatment for it, but none was really needed as, like all plagues, it simply died out as quickly as it started. Sadly, though, the damage was done. More than a billion humans died in the span of ten years, more than half of the total remaining populace of the Earth after Skyfall. By then, it was too late for them to actually win. Fighting the virus put them behind in the war for the world, and in the end, vampires had come out on top as the new dominant race of planet Earth. Because of how their society viewed those 
they see as the strongest lichens came under the rule of their new lord, serving as soldiers, bodyguards, and enforcers, leaving humans unable to fight against this new world power. With their, their new status at the top of the world's global food chain, the vampires desired a nation, a true nation for their kind. Reaching a deal with the 70th and final president of the United States, Jackson Conroe, the vampires enacted the Conroe Treaty, which effectively gave up control of the continental United States, Canada, Mexico, Central America, and the tip of South America to the vampires. The Conroe Treaty effectively disbanded the United States as it was, thus establishing what is now called the Grand Vampiric Empire, led by by Emperor Vladimir Zipeshish Dracula II, the son of the first true king of all vampires. Being wise and fairer than you'd expect, Emperor Vlad II strived to create a true nation of all races, regardless of their origins, and encouraged all to stay and prosper, including humans. It goes without saying that humans are sore losers, and we're not about to live under the rule of the so-called godless demons. Less than 500,000 humans remained in the empire, while the rest left for other nations and lands to dream of once was. Well, that was over a thousand years ago. Since that time, the empire has become one of this era's three great nations, alongside the protectorate of Vatican and the kingdom of Khan. It provides most of the world's major technological resources and advancements. Its econ economy stands second only to the POV, and its military might is considered amongst the strongest in the world. This is where our story really begins. It is now the year 1076 NW. The world you know is gone. Welcome to the new world. And in the new world, everything is possible. Chapter 1 a simple job. Hey, Ma. Well, it took you long enough to call, Lucas. I'm on a job, Mom. It doesn't lend much time to call. It doesn't change the fact that you need to call your mother more. Sorry, Mom. So where are you? Los Angeles. Los Angeles? You aren't messing around at those dirty-ass casinos, are you? Hell no! You know I have shitty luck at gambling. I'm in old Los Angeles. I guess that's better, I suppose. Is that rain I hear? Yeah, it's been raining a bit since we landed. Are you at least wearing a raincoat? And I mean a proper raincoat, not that dingy piece of crap that you wear all the time. It works well enough, Ma. When you get home, use your money and buy a good raincoat, or at the very least a hat. I don't need a hat, Ma. It's not like I get sick anyway. It just means you are due to be sick. Now promise me when this job is over, you will buy a hat. Ugh, fine. I will buy a stupid hat. Happy? Very. Now I won't keep you. Tell the others I said hi. I will. Love you, Ma. Love you too, dear. This is Lucas Kane. Age 37, height 5 feet 10, weight 205 pounds, although he says he needs to lose weight. Eye color brown, hair color gray silver, species human, occupation freelancer. A bit of an explanation on that last part. A freelancer is a term given to a person who performs services and duties beyond those of regular law enforcement. They are bodyguards, private investigators, bounty hunters, negotiators, etc. Whatever job is needed at the time, a freelancer does it. For a modest fee, of course. And Lucas Kane is considered one of the best in the Empire. Hence why he's here in this deserted street across from an old hotel in this lovely area known as Old Los Angeles. Old Los Angeles is just like it sounds. An old part of, the, of Los Angeles that was formerly submerged into tons of seawater up until about 200 or so years ago when the city enacted the Los Angeles Renovation Initiative. The plan was to unflood the area to expand the city. Using a series of dams and irrigation systems, the, pl the parts of the city that were, were brought back to life and began a series of urban renewals. 
Sadly, the area has fallen into hard times and has since become a ghetto, a refuge of the worst of society. It is to this forgotten part of the most visited city in the empire that Cain finds himself in. The rain beat upon his naked head without a care for the impact of such an act. His hands ran through his locks, slicking his hair back due to the water. An old brown trench coat that his mother didn't like did the job of keeping him relatively warm and dry. He placed his cell phone into his black jeans pocket next to his gun holster. A slight grimace appeared on his face. His large silver boots were caked in mud from the, from the rain and dirt. I could see that he did not like the feeling of mud in his shoes, but there was no time for personal comfort. There was work to do. Next to him was a large black briefcase, much larger than the enormous normal business style. His eyes scanned the seemingly abandoned building in front of him, his mind at work planning the events to come in the next few minutes. Reaching into his jacket pocket to reveal a pair of tinted goggles and wrap them around his neck. I wouldn't understand the purpose of such an item until much later. His hand reached up to his ear. It was then I caught sight of something in his ear, akin to a hearing aid almost. Tapping the small object informed me there was some type of communications device. This was correct as he began to speak into it in a lower tone of voice. Testing. One, two. Anyone got their ears on? He muttered. The first force to respond was that of a woman. This is Reese. I can hear you very clearly, Lucas Kane. The voice was calm, collected, and professional, almost cold with a hint of nobility on the tip end. Glad to hear you. You find a good spot? He asked, his eye casting an upward, outward glance around in a vain attempt to catch sight of his partner. Thankfully for me, my eyesight is a bit better than a human's. My zooming vision found the position of the woman in question, which was a couple of miles away from the to on top of a building that had seen better days. Say hello to Miss Reese Bode. Age 167, height 5'9". Weight. You should never ask a woman her weight. Eye color blue, hair color violet. Race, elf, occupation, freelancer slash sniper. Her position was perfect as a sniper's nest. Appro appropriate seeing as how this lady is one of the highest ranked snipers in the Empire. Graduated at the top of her class at Callus Military Academy for Elves with near perfect marks. I could hear her, I could see her form being somewhat hidden by a special cloth that protected her from the elements and blitted into the environment. From her prone position, she held the tool of her trade, a Mark V Alistair Magitek sniper rifle, custom built to fire 500 caliber impact rounds, which were small enough, smart, strong enough to punch a hole through solid steel and still retain their shape. Her eye gazed through the special custom scope that gave her a perfect view of Kane from over five miles away. This was her lethal tool of her trade, affectionately called Whisper, by its talented owner. Truly, this woman took exceptional pride in her craft. It was not easy finding a proper spot, not in this area at least, but I do have you in sight. Good. The rain not giving you problems? Please, she said in a tone of dismissal. I have worked in worse weather. He smirked at her comment. Always professional, but that's why he enjoyed working with her. A little rain never bothered anyone anyhow. That's what I like to hear, Reese. No problems with visibility? He asked. Nothing too troublesome. I have you in my sights, and while I'm at it, please refrain from scratching your bottom. A wide-eyed look of shock rolled on his rain-soaked face. You can see that? Unfortunately. A mischievous grin grew on Lucas's face. Before, he only did it as, as something that only men do, but now he did it to annoy her. Her voice took on a colder edge as she spoke again. If you do not cease that horrific activity, I will shoot you in the head. Lucas turned to her general direction enough that his face appeared fully in her scope. Would you really shoot me in the face? Not that head, she said, punctuating her threat by chambering around into whisper loud enough that he could hear it in his earpiece. He paled somewhat, knowing her sight was set squarely on his private area. 
She was dead serious about shooting him in the dick. She was as serious as she was professional, and her threats were never threats for long. Lucas removed his hand from his butt before speaking again. Yo, Thorgan! You on yet? The answer came from a male voice that sounded like a tainted mix of Irish, Scottish, and a hundred-year-old whiskey. Aye, I hear ya. But time you got to me, the voice said incredulously. Well, you should have answered first, Lucas explained. That's not my fault that I'm stuck in the trudging through these damnable sewers. Funny, I thought dwarves were at home in the filth of others, Reese chimed in. Ooh, and is that the dulcet tones of elf bitch I hear in me ear? Or is it the dying cries of an old yeti, much past her prime? You would do best you would best watch your mouth, Thorgan Riffall, or I shall return your body to your family for a proper burial. Oh, I thank you, lass. I'll make sure that when this is over, I'll give you a nice big hug. You will not make it fifty meters near me, dwarf. Guys! Lucas raged, finally tiring of their back-and-forth bickering. I swear you two mar argue like an old married couple, Lucas... Lucas's comment was met with muttered curses in both elvish and dwarvish. That's not funny, lad. Not very funny at all. For once I agree with the dwarf. Do not make such a statement again. A gloved hand rubbed the human's forehead in stress from the back and forth between his two partners. You know, he would almost find it funny if it wasn't so annoying. Whatever, kill me later. How long before you get into position, Thor? he asked. He could hear the sloshing of dirty water and the grunting of effort to get through said water. Ah, there was a bit of work being done in the subways a while days back. Had a bit of trouble getting in past the damp workers. Give me about mm, ten minutes. I should be in position by then, Thorgan answered. How's Mr. Parker? Oh, he'll be ready to rumble when the time comes. And Groose? Ah! The dwarf groaned. You know how he is, lad. The last time I saw him... He was up and about Sunset Boulevard. I swear he's going to get in a heap of trouble if he keeps doing that. He'll be here. Bad habits aside, he's reliable, Lucas confidently said for their missing partner. All right, kiddies, it's serious time. We're going to play this one easy. Reese, you got my six. Keep an eye on me at all times. As the kids would say, I have your back, Lucas Kane. Thor, you set up the party favors. I want a nice fireworks display by the time when the time is right. Oh, do not worry, lad. When I'm done, it'll look like bloody Empire Day. That's what I like to hear," said Lucas, reaching into his, reaching down to pick up the black case next to him. Okay, it's showtime. Lucas walked across the rained-out streets towards the old, seemingly abandoned hotel. I say seemingly because, like myself, Lucas doubted the building wasn't as abandoned as it seemed. I could hear his thoughts as he passed through the large metal fence that surrounded the property. Assess. Plan. Execute. That was the mantra he learned from his years as a New York City detective. Assess. Plan. Execute. Assess the situation. Learn all you can about your surroundings, your enemies, what they can do, and how well they can do it. Plan an appropriate strategy. Take what you've learned from your assessments and formulate a plan to achieve your goals. Execute the strategy. Activate the plan and perform it as fast and effectively as possible. This was part of his training. This part of his training he took to the life of a freelancer and it worked for it. He never needed to change what worked. As his eyes scanned the area, I knew Lucas was proceeding with step one. He took note of all the well-hidden protection rooms across the inner edges of the fences to prevent surveillance, either electronic or mystical. There was a small remote, there was small remote cameras placed in positions around the property, some even tracking his movements as soon as he walked into view. Beneath his feet he could feel the hum of almost, almost unnoticeable hum of electricity running beneath the ground, meaning that there was power going into this place. There was no doubt about it. This wasn't some random ramshackle wreck they chose to, for this deal. No, this building was alive and humming with activity. But someone went to a lot of trouble to hide that fact. His plan was coming together, but he still needed more info. Lucas arrived at the massive door to the hotel and knocked. 
His eyebrows crunched together. The door was not normal. It felt thicker, heavier than a door for this kind of building should have. It was reinforced, probably with titanium and something else. Probably eternium. Either way, you'd need some serious firepower to make a dent in this door. But his assessments didn't stop there. If the front of the door was reinforced, it stands to reason most, if not all, of the building was too. This was very good to know. Just as he finished his thought, a slat in the upper part of the door slid open and a pair of very angry eyes peered at Lucas as a deep, rumbling voice spoke to him. Who are you? Deciding to keep things light, Lucas flipped the case up with his palm under the flat side. Piece of delivery. I know it's a bit late, but you did ask for extra Nessie, and that stuff takes a while to cook, he quipped with a grin. The eyes were not amused. The slat quickly shut before Lucas could hear the sounds of locks sliding out of place and clicking open. The door swung open, revealing a rather large-looking humanoid in a red shirt, black hair, bronze skin, hairy cloven legs, and part of horn sticking out from his forehead. He was a satyr, which didn't surprise Lucas a bit. Satyrs were a common sight in the criminal underworld, and why wouldn't they be? Satyrs were the perfect hired guns. Strong, tough, reliable, and not too smart to think of anything else beyond the job, and the pay which most consisted of, consisted of booze and women. That'll be nineteen drax, he joked, but the satyr merely grunted at him while motioning him to enter. Walking into what was once the lobby, Lucas assessed his surroundings. Six more satyrs were over by the front desk, huddled around a rather large TV while watching the big EWA tag team match. There were at least 30 or more humans loitering around the room, some cleaning their guns, others engaged in gambling. He could see them playing demon dice in New Texas Hold'em, with one of them winning a fairly large pot of draclas. There, there were weapons all over the place, from swords to of varying lengths to handguns to assault rifles, some of which were ready and loaded. As he was led through the lobby, the sound of disgusting slurps and munching caused him to cast a glance in the area that he assumed was once the main dining area. Inside, he saw a large mass of green sitting at a table about, with about eight platters of food spread out. The creature, who seemed too big for the chair it was sitting in, was eating by the handful, barely having time to breathe. They, it was a cave troll, and a rather large one at that. This was not good. Trolls were not native to the Empire in, in any way. In fact, the only place in the New World where they could be found was Australia, and it was rare to see one of them anywhere else. Trolls were large enough to crush a car, strong enough to throw a bus, and were more likely to eat you rather than beat you to death since their appetites were legendarily massive. Look, looks like his research was right about the man behind this. Not only did he have the drags to buy a cave troll, but had the influence to get that big fellow past customs and go completely unnoticed. This was unexpected, but it wasn't something beyond his ability to plan around. His horned guide, his horned host guided him to an elevator that was being guarded by a dark-skinned human with shifting eye, colored eyes. Lucas's face frowned a bit. He was on flux. It was the newest designer drug that hit the streets about a year ago. It gave you a high much greater than Nero Coke, but the downside was that it made you quick to anger and totally paranoid, evidenced by the, by the color of the eyes shifting from one hue to another. The human pressed the call button and the elevator slid open. Not gonna frisk me, he asked. Not my job. That's for upstairs, the goon answered, motioning him to enter the car with a drawn pistol. Lucas calmly walked in, not wanting to give this junkie any reason to be suspicious of him and deciding that to put an impact round in his head. You're heading for the seventh floor. You don't go to any other floors but the seventh. This car is rigged with enough explosives to send you to the POV first class, and we got the car rigged with cameras, so don't get any funny ideas. You try to get off on another floor, we blow the car. You try to get out in any way, we blow the car. Hell, if you even scratch your balls, we blow the car, he warned. Now, wait a damn minute, started Lucas. I reserve the right to scratch my balls. It's my right as a man. The goon gave him a withering look just as his eyes shifted f 
from a deep blue to a light purple before punching the button and the doors closed. Lucas steadied himself as he felt the car shudder and move upwards. He was sure not to make any unnecessary movements with his arms or hands. If they said the car was wired to blow, he had all the incentive in the world to believe them. Thankfully, they didn't crack, they didn't check his case. That would have put a major kink in his plans, which is, was taking shape as the minutes ticked by. Finally arriving at the designated floor, the door slid open to reveal a tall, well-dressed elf holding a rather large Magitex assault rifle. Mr. Kane, we've been expecting you, he greeted, motioning him with a gun to exit. The floor was a world apart from the lobby downstairs. Nice new carpeting covered the floor, the smell of fresh paint entered his lungs, and the doors were newly installed on the fronts of the rooms. Swanky was all Lucas spoke as he took to his new in surroundings. He was more than certain that if he didn't know he was in one of the worst ghettos in the Empire, he could have sworn he was in a new hotel, ready for guests. This boss was not only careful and cautious, but he was slowly certain to use, used to a certain lifestyle. The gears turned in his head. His research was right on the money. The poke of the gun in his back told him to keep moving. Making his way down the hall, he arrived at his destination, the seventh room from the elevator. On either side of the door were, was six more well-dressed elves, similarly armed like the one behind him. In front of the door was a small security table with another elf seated at it, and behind him was what he assumed was a metal detector. Fortunately for him, his earpiece was made out of plastic, so it was all but undetectable by modern metal detectors. As long as they didn't search his ear, they would never know he had it. Mr. Kane, I see you found your way here, spoke the seated elf. I had good directions, he quipped. So I take it that the case contains the money? Lucas brought the case up to eye level. That's right. Fifty million drachmas, all new bills and totally untraceable. A pleased look rolled on the seated elf's face. Excellent. Now, if you will leave the money here, we will complete this transaction, he spoke, reaching for the case, only for the human to pull it back sharply. Uh-uh. I don't think so. His words caused the other guards to action, the sound of them readying and cocking their rifles. Now, there are two important facts about elves that you need to know in a situation like this that are very important, and Lucas knew these two facts very well that would dictate what actions he would take in the next few seconds. One, elves are fast. Unbelievably fast. Their reflexes and hand speeds are not to be underestimated in the least. Even compared to vampires and lichens, elves can outdraw the best of the best, and humans don't even rate in this regard. Two, elves were very good shots. That is, the understatement of, that is an understatement on my part. Elves were commonly known to be the most accurate shots in the Empire, whether it was with pistols, rifles, knives, or bows and arrows. When an elf took aim, they almost always hit their targets. Working closely with an elf, Lucas knew very well how good they were when it came to projectile weaponry. Now Lucas was in the quandary of sorts. He could draw his own weapon, possibly take out two, maybe three of them if he were lucky, but eight elves? That was a no-win situation for him. No, a gunfight was out of the question right now. The gears turned again. He would have to talk his way out of this and hope they fell for it. Mind repeating that again, Mr. Kane? The seated elf spoke, his hand in his, on his own pistol holstered in his coat. Now, if you let me explain, he started. I'm a freelancer. A pretty damn good one, if you don't mind me saying so. I built up a certain reputation as one of the best. Why, you ask? Well, I'll tell you. Professionalism. As a freelancer, it's my duty to perform the job I've been given to the best of my ability, and this is no different. I have been hired to negotiate between parties A and B regarding the transfer of a sum of 50 million drachma, new bills untraceable, to party A, from party A, i.e. my current employers, for the safe release and return of their son from the head of party B, i.e. your boss. You know what this, that means, right? The only way this cash is leaving my hands is the only way I will give you directly to your boss not to some security goon. They hadn't shot him yet. Lucas was on a roll. 
So to, so say I were to give this cash to you, and it doesn't end up in his hands, either because you lost it or decided to go on a shopping spree, then everyone loses. Your boss loses 50 mil in cash, my employers lose their son, and my reputation goes down the shitter. And don't even think of trying to take this from me, because I, I assure you that your boss, that the boss man will not see a single track from me, and then you can explain to him why he didn't get his money. So do you understand, or should I break out the flashcards? Lucas pulled out his intimidation face, something he hadn't done since his days as a police detective, and, started, and stared right into the elf's face. For what seemed like an eternity, no one did a thing. The guards had their guns trained on him, and Lucas trained his glare on the seated elf. He noticed the grip on his gun relax before sliding out of his jacket. His bluff had worked. Fine, you win, he started. You can see the boss, but you need to be searched. Of course, said Lucas. We're all professionals here. The human raised his arms as the elf stood up and began to frisk him. Almost immediately, he discovered the two pistols on either side of his waist. He removed them from their holsters, eyeing them with admiration. Impressive. Mark II Magitech revolvers, the elf commented. New Texas models. Don't see these used being anymore. Eh, they got style. The Mark II Magitech revolvers were an older model of, standard, of the standard handgun, sometimes used by various law enforcement agencies within the Empire, until the advent of the Mark III's. Nowadays, the Mark II's were more showpieces than actual sidearms, but still a powerful firearm due to the fact that they still used variable rounds as opposed to the modern-day impact rounds. I will explain what variable rounds are in a bit. These, baby, these puppies would fetch a good price at an auction. Yeah, I'm going to get those back. The elf dismissed his comment as he placed the guns on the table. That is, until Lucas slapped his palm down to get his attention. Seriously, I'm going to get those back. There was a deadly seriousness in his voice that the elf didn't ignore. There was nothing to suggest that he would truly get his guns back, but the look on his face was enough to tell him that it would be best that this man receive his firearms at the conclusion of this deal. Wordlessly, the well-dressed elf continued his search. His cell phone in his pants pocket, a pack of gum in his back pocket, and a pack of high wolf cigarettes in his coat pocket. Lucas's face balked. Aw, oh, man, not the smokes, he whined. Can't be too careful. Come on, it's a pack of smokes. Judging from the look on his face, his pleas were falling on deaf ears. How about just one, a, just how about a single? It can't hurt. The elf considered the request for a moment. Seeing no harm in it, he opened the new pack, removed a single stick of tobacco, and placed it comfortably in his coat pocket. Lucas's face broke into a wide, bright grin. Ah, you're a pal. Thus ended his short pat-down, allowing Lucas to pass through the metal detector with ease and to enter the room. Turning the knob, Lucas opened the door and walked in to find, not surprisingly, a room as well-furnished and immaculate as the rest of the floor behind him. There was another pair of guards on either side of the door, all very well-dressed and similarly armed, as the ones outside. There were a few nice paintings on either side of the wall, probably worth more than he was being paid for this job. As the door behind him closed, his eyes caught sight of, a, of the seal between the walls. A piece falls into place in his plan. Ahead was a large, well-made desk, trimmed in gold and a few fine decorations. Yet again, something that he was more likely couldn't afford. Behind the desk, with his back to him, was an elf with black hair and a blue pinstripe suit, his eyes looking out a large window that not only gave him a great view of the ruined neighborhood, but an awesome view of New Los Angeles far in the distance. The elf smoothly turned to face him, an expensive-looking earring dangling from one of his pointed ears. Lucas Kane, he proclaimed. Welcome. Right on time. Well, I like to be punctual which I appreciate. Please, he extended his hand to the seat in front of him. Lucas took the seat offered to him, relaxing his posture as his host sat down. Like the desk? 
Do you? It's made of solid Ottawa oak, straight from the north. Very expensive. The human glided his hand, gloved hand across the surface of the wood. I can tell. Wish I had something like this in my office. The boss raised his eyebrow. Really? The most famous freelancer in the Empire can't afford a desk like this? Lucas gave a muted chuckle. Just because I'm somewhat famous doesn't mean I'm rich. Good point. He agreed. Speaking of money, his eyes drafted, drifted to the case next to him. Oh, you mean this? Lucas asked, lifting the object in question. Yep. Fifty million drax, per the agreement. And you will receive it once negotiations are finished between you and I. Oh, really? The elf asked, seating himself behind the very well, seating himself very well at the well-made desk. And what's stopping me from, say, ordering my men to simply take it from you? Hypothetically? The elf smirked, bridging his fingers together. Of course. Then, hypothetically, you wouldn't get your money. Please elaborate. Lucas held the object in question higher as he began to explain. You see this case? This isn't just some case I picked up at the gift shop on my way here. This is a custom job, made by a very talented dwarf I know. It's a triple encoded lock system built to my own specifications. Handprint, ID on the handle, password protected, and designed with multiple fail-safes to prevent anyone who isn't me from opening it. The handprint scanner not only won't ID any other hand other than my own, but it has a nifty little bio-reader. That means, if my hand isn't attached to my body, it ain't opening. The password system also has a nice little voice stress analyzer that can gauge my physical stress and health by the pitch and tone of my voice. Meaning, if I am in perfect, unless I'm in perfect health and utterly stress-free, not getting into this baby. And lastly, if you just try to crack this bad boy open by other means, the seams have pressure-sensitive triggers along the edge. Anyone who tries to pry it open will trip off a special surprise that will spray the contents with a highly corrosive acid that will turn anything inside of it, in this case money, into, mass, into a massive melted slag. So hypothetically speaking, if you take this from me, then you don't get paid. The elf absorbed this information as he that he was presented with. He had no reason to believe a single word of it, but Lucas said it in such, such a way that despite his reservations, the possibility of the validity of his claims could be just. His face was a stone wall of neutrality, hiding his thoughts over the subject. Eventually, he broke out into a small chuckle. <laughs> Very impressive, Mr. Kane, he started. You certainly do live up to your reputation. The consummate professional. It's what I do, Lucas spoke, placing the case down next to his chair. So, shall we begin, the elf asked. Not just yet, my friend. You see, I have a question. The elf raised his eyebrow in response to the statement. Now, Lucas was an inquisitive man by nature from his years as a detective. Even at, after more than a decade had passed since he hung up his badge and coat for the life of a freelancer, he still remained inquisitive to a fault. If he has questions, he will want answers. And if Lucas Kane wants answers, he will get them. A question? Just a simple question. He looked at Lucas as an adult would look at a child who asked where babies come from. Finally, he relented. Ask away. Satisfied, Lucas relaxed his posture slightly before he spoke again. Now, when we took this job, we did a little digging. The comment didn't see the phase of the elf, which Lucas expected. What kind of digging? A lot. More so than we usually do. When this place was announced as the negotiation site, we dug into it to see just what this place was all about. I don't like to enter situations like this without knowing some facts. Guess what we learned? His inquisition was met with the elf opening his palms to him, wordlessly saying to him to share what he learned. This building, no, this entire block was recently bought out by Wyndham Consolidated, a little property management company based out of Alabama City. But here's the kicker. It's just a shell company. It doesn't exist except on paper. 
Really, now? The elf's smugness was apparent, but Lucas was no less deterred. Yep. Did more digging and found out that the company was owned by another company out of New Texas. Not surprising, it was another fake. One by one, we found over ten separate fake companies, conglomerates, and corporations. Someone really wanted to cover their tracks about this. Indeed. Quite a shame. Yeah, or it would be. You see, my info girl, she's really good at finding shit out, especially when it concerns a few misplaced checks that the guy forgot to flush. The elf's smugness died a bit as Lucas continued. It took some doing, but we found him. Who did you find? He asked, less amused and more concerned. Elias Strife. Ninth son of Albus Strife, second generation president of Strife Motors, the Empire's second leading producer of ether drives. It said that every everything on four wheels has a Strife ether drive in it. Lucas leaned in forward slightly. Thus, we come to my question. If you are indeed Elias Strife, then why would someone as well off as you resort to kidnapping? The elf's face was a stony mix of silent frustration, indignation, and astonishment. Part of him was very well much tempted to have this human killed, damning the money to preserve his concealment. But another part, the arrogant part, wanted to show off his brilliance and cunning to this most dangerous of freelancers. A slow, deep chuckle erupted from his throat. <laughs> My dear Mr. Kane. You are indeed very good at your job. And here I thought I did a better job at covering my tracks. It's not your fault, Kane said. It's just that my team is very good at what I paid them to do. Strife arose from his seat and turned to the window, looking at the cityscape around him. Very well, Mr. Kane, I will answer your question with a question of my own. I'm all ears. The words that flowed from his mouth were dripping with self-feeding pride and arrogance that only those who deem themselves smarter than everyone around them would have. Does the name Drigger Ogroof mean anything to you? A quizzical look of recognition slid on Lucas's face. The Iron Midget? Who hasn't? He answered. The guy was the biggest crime boss, in, one of the biggest crime bosses in the Empire. Said he controlled every bit of crime from here to the Alaskan Islands. Correct, Strife replied, and I take it you know what happened to him two months ago. Yeah, the guy was gunned down at his favorite bar. Heard it was so full of holes you could read a newspaper through his corpse. Correct again. And right now, across this city, a gang war is raging. All of his lieutenants clashing over who will gain control of his vast organization. A battle for the crown, all because of one dead Dwarf. I know all that, Cain started. What does that have to do with this? He turned around dramatically to Lucas. All of it, he exclaimed. You see, people see crime as something only the desperate do. But the way I see it, crime is just another name for business. Think about it. Different products to sell, different services to offer, buyouts, investments, product quality and the most hostile of hostile takeovers. Right now, out there, the board of directors are fighting over a company that is now rudderless without a CEO. What I'm doing is simple. I'm filling the void. Lucas's face began to morph from a look of inqu inquisition to that of slow understanding and realization. All the pieces had finally fallen into place. Now I get it, he started building, the guns, the goons downstairs, the cave troll, the extra security rooms outside. You're building an army to take his place. There you go, Stripe said with a smile. Before, ask, before you ask the inevitable question of why I would want to take over his organization if I'm rich already, I will simply answer with this. I am not as rich as you think I am. The freelancer's eyebrow raised in almost disbelief, earning a smaller chuckle from his host. Rest assured, my friend, my family is quite wealthy. Myself? Not so much. 
Sure, my siblings and I receive a monthly allowance that is more than enough than an average person would make in a full year, but still not enough to say that I am rich. My father encourages us to make our own way in the world instead of relying on his vast fortune. When the Iron Midget died, I saw my opportunity to carve out my own fortune, and with the, the money that was that I was getting was far from enough for my plans, and I couldn't well risk asking my father for more money without giving away what I planned. Hence the money, Lucas added. That fifty million drachmas will act as the seed money for my conquest of the criminal world. With it, I can buy the loyalty of the lowest street gangs in the city, increasing my ranks. And those I can't buy out, I'll just remove them from the equation. Thanks to my contacts in the arms industry, I can equip my men with better firearms than the meager pop guns my rivals are using. And the cave troll? I know a few higher overseers in the customs who look the other way. Smuggling a troll into the country is very easy. He explained. With that money, by the end of the month, I'll be a major player in this little war. In two months, I'll have full control of the city. And by the end of the year, I will have conquered the midget's former empire and made it my own. And no one would be the wiser. Yes, I will spread rumors and stories about the new boss of the East Coast in the streets. I'll have the cops chasing shadows and mists for years, and all the while I will be basking in my newfound wealth and power. Hmm. I have to admit, it's an ambitious and impressive plan, Lucas said. I'd be more impressed if you hadn't felt the need to snatch a kid from his parents. That being said, he started as he took his seat again. Now that you know my plans, what do you intend to do about it? His question had a slight effect on the human. I could see in Lucas's face a look of... Well, no word can accurately describe the look. I'd say it's more akin to him wanting to reach across the desk and punch the arrogant elf in the face. Job be damned. I don't know if Strife could see the look or recognize it for what it was, or... but... I know for sure that it was a tempting prospect for our dear friend Lucas. The look passed as fast as it arrived as Lucas took a more relaxed posture in his seat. If I was a cop, I'd bust your ass faster than you can blink. But, he started, I'm not a cop anymore. This is my job now. I'm just here to give you your money and bring the kid back to his parents. The cops can handle you, if they can. A wide grin erupted on Stripe's face. Good answer. I like people who don't ask too many questions. Now with that out of the way, just hand me the money in. First, bring the kid in. His quick statement caught the elf off guard. I'm sorry? The kid. Bring him in here. And what makes you think he's here? Oh, please, said Lucas. You're a businessman. You wouldn't keep an asset like him somewhere where you couldn't keep a solid eye on him. You wouldn't want someone else to take him, or one of your goons deciding to get smart and hide the kid to goose you out of the money. Also, he leaned in closer for, the, for this next bit. I've been around his kind my whole life. I know the smell very well, and despite how this room looks, it reeks of him. So why don't you stop playing stupid and bring the kid in here? As Lucas leaned back in his seat, it was clear to anyone, me included, that Strife was once again sussed out by this human. He'd probably admire the guy if everything he'd been planning for months didn't hinge on the money he was getting. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a small cell phone. After dialing a number, he said something in Elvish. I can tell you right now that Lucas didn't speak or understand the language. He never took the time or effort to learn it, even though he works with an elf himself. I, on the other hand, can understand it. All he said was, bring him in, before turning off the device. A few seconds later, the rattle of the doorknob called the elf and the human's attention as another well-dressed elf entered the si from the side room. In his arms was a small, silver-furred puppy, although it wasn't a puppy. It was a baby lichen, a very young one at that. Its age was clear to Lucas since... Very young lichens haven't mastered the ability to shift between wolf and man, making them look like puppies to the uninformed observer. 
poor thing looked utterly frightened, but otherwise okay. This was the last piece that Lucas needed for his plan. Now he can begin. Satisfied, Mr. Kane? asked Strife. Lucas turned to him, reaching into his jacket pocket to retrieve the lone cigarette he was allowed. More than enough. Now we can complete this little transaction. He held this tobacco stick between his fingers. Got a light? Ever the good host, Strife retrieved his gold-plated lighter from his desk drawer and gave him the light he wanted. He took a drag from it, inhaling the smoke into his lungs, causing him to violently cough in reaction. <coughs> so, the money for the kid? He choked out between fits of coughs and hacks. We have an agreement. Even though he got his money, the elf started to feel a bit bad for Lucas, who seemed to be on the verge of passing out. A word of friendly advice, Mr. Kane? You might want to think about quitting. I don't think you can handle smoking anymore. Lucas let out a laugh, or something that could be called a laugh, I couldn't really tell, due to his coughing. You know, <coughs> that's actually quite funny. And why is that? Because... <coughs> I don't smoke. Before he and anyone else in the room could process the meaning of the statement, Lucas had already flicked the bud into the air. He quickly slipped on the goggles around his neck, just as the, the cigarette exploded in a green flash of light blinding the elves. Lucas picked a spot to act, and act he did. He moved faster than a lot of people would believe he was capable of. In fact, I actually had to pull out a, my watch just to time it. Point five seconds, Lucas grabs the edge of the table and flips it up into the face of Strife. One second, Lucas jumps from his chair, advances to the leftmost guard. He grabs the barrel of the gun with his left hand, smashing him in the jaw with a perfectly delivered elbow strike. He is unconscious. 1.5 seconds, twisting the rifle around in his hand, he turns it into a makeshift club, laying a very solid blow on the, uh, with the butt to the right of most guard. He is unconscious. Two seconds. He slides out the magazine and throws it at the last guard's face. Dazed and confused, he is unable to react when Lucas advances over to deliver a painful looking headbutt. He is unconscious. 2.5 seconds. Lucas turns his attention to the desk and, and what could, he could imagine was a very befuddled strife. He jumps over with a very impressive looking Superman punch, his fist blowing through the expensive wood and finding its home in the elf's exposed chin. He is unconscious. Total time, 2.5 seconds. Removing his goggles, he surveyed the room full of unconscious elves and one very shaken lichen pup on the floor. He leaned down to check on him, only to have the poor thing whimper and shy away from him. Hey, shh he said gently, in a, in a gentle, hushed tone. I'm a friend. I'm taking you home to your parents. Upon hearing the prospect of seeing his family, he instantly perked up. Lucas scratched behind the cub's ear, getting him to relax and trust him. He looked over at the semi-smashed table and retrieved his case. Okay, kiddo, this is going to be a bit scary and cramped, but you're going to be safe in here. Lucas popped the case open to reveal nothing. Not a single drachma to be found but more than enough room for a young lichen cub. Wearily, the cub snipped inside before it carefully crawled inside. Lucas gave the youngster a quick thumbs up before closing the tile. Reese, you got me? He asked in his earpiece. I saw everything. You could have been faster. Well, I'm sorry I couldn't kick ass fast enough for you. And your mother was right. You really should invest in a hat. If we can move along... He said in gritted, between gritted teeth. How's it looking outside? The sniper changed her scope setting to a thermal, allowing her to view the body heat of the guards outside, all of whom seemed unaware of what was happening in the room. The guards seemed clueless. I thought so, said. I noticed the layers between the doors. The whole room soundproof. Bet our dear prince here didn't want the help listening in on any business transactions. A wise precaution. So what now? Well, I need to get out of here and get my guns back. Can you take care of these guys? Can you take care of those guys? Please duck your head and do not get up until I tell you to. He certainly did what he as he was told. 
This is what Lucas called Reese's shoot mode, where she wholly focuses on the task of sniping and killing those she deems no longer deserving of the gift of life. And when she is like this, it's best not to interrupt her. He still had the scar in his right ear from one such incident. Loading the first round into the large mag up from the large magazine into, into the whisper, she took a solid aim at the seated heat signature. He would be first. Squeezing the trigger, the round erupted from the barrel, traveled through the rain and wind over several miles, punched through the glass window, pierced the door, and found its home in the neck of her target. From the perspective of the other seven men, the only thing they would have likely have heard is a muffled grunt from their compatriot. It would also be the last thing they would probably hear. With cold, ruthless efficiency, she let loose another seven shots, each making seven holes in seven heads, ending seven lives. Just like that, eight elves were killed, and no, and had no idea of the identity of their killer. This was Reese Fold, and this is why she was the best sniper in the Empire. And Lucas Kane could not be happier. You may rise. The human did it as he was told, peeking his head and eyeing the holes in the windows and the walls. My dear, you are a beast! Indeed, she replied as she reloaded Whisper. Case in hand, Lucas walked out of the room, coming across the bloody remains of his hosts. He gathered up his belongings from the table, chief among them being his two pistols. Told you I'd get these back, he said to the corpse of the formerly seated elf as he holstered his guns. I wouldn't celebrate just yet, Lucas Kane. What's up? He, his tone was more serious, to match the sudden urgency of, this, of the of tone of his sniper. I am seeing a mass of heat signatures coming up the stairs very fast. I think someone must have triggered a silent alarm. Shit! How long before they get here? Two minutes, max. Oh, I love pressure, he muttered. Okay, Thor, where are you? I'm in the basement, said the dwarf. Just clean up the rats. I'm waiting for you, lad. Good. And Groose? Ah, oh, just talk to him. He'll be here in five minutes. Well, that's cutting it close. All right, Reese, we're gonna, you're going to have to guide me down. I don't really want to get into a gunfight right now. Understood. There is an empty room five do doors down from your current position. Go now. Gotcha. Lucas fast-walked his way to the free room, breaking the lock to get in. He quickly shut the door behind him, his back leaning against the wood. After a minute or so, the sounds of angry shouts and running filled the hallway. When I say so, head for the stairs. Lucas tightened his grip on the case and readied himself to move as fast and as quietly as possible. Now! With the same swiftness he showed in the room, he snapped the door open and glided into the hall. He caught sight of a mass of goons around the office and dead bodies and the dead bodies. He didn't have time to wait around to see what they were planning. He launched himself through the door and dashed down the stairs. All he had to do was get to the basement and hope he didn't run into anyone. Five hostiles coming up. Get off at the fifth floor. He complained. With, he complied without a word of complaint. The fifth floor was not as well made as the seventh. Not that he cared. He just wanted to run, not to run into anyone. There was another stairway at the end of the hall. Move now. His pace quickened, but not into a run. He didn't need to waste energy needlessly. He just, wanted, he just wanted his luck to hold out. Sadly, the gods were not that kind. What the? It was from a human goon. He emerged, by chance, from the, the fourth room from the stairs. He had come to this room to toke up on his stash of elven weed he had bought off the guards. It wasn't until he got word on his radio to look for the human freelancer who had attacked the boss and killed eight guards. He was reluctantly on his way to, do, to join the search when he just happened to on the said human freelancer. Lucas's reflexes kicked in as he as his right hand blurred to his right his revolver and pointed it at the hapless man. Now remember when I said these guns were special because they used variable rounds? This is a perfect moment to explain what they are. Variable rounds are named so because due to the enchantment placed upon the shell casings they were able to change the type of ammunition fired from them, depending on the chant used that the user said before he fired, and Lucas was able to show this poor victim one of these types. Aria! 
He pulled the trigger, and instead of a bullet, what came out was a, of the barrel was a massive gust of wind. The man was blown back into the room and out of the window, joined by bits of wood and furniture and glass. Damn it, Lucas cursed to himself. You should be mad. That little display has alerted the others to your, lo to your position. I kind of got that. His comment was direct was directed towards the his comment directed towards the arrival of two more goons, guns drawn and ready. Firia. He fired around at the two, this time taking the form of a blast of fire. One of them ducked into the hallway of the stairway. The other was not so lucky. The sound of three more goons coming from the other end caused Lucas to whip his head around. He fired again, unleashing yet another torrent of fire on his aggressors. Unfortunately, they were fast enough to retreat into an open room, avoiding the flames. The dual wall of crimson fire gave him a brief barrier against the small army rallying against him, although it didn't stop them from firing rounds blindly at him. He dove back into the ruined room, the sound of impact rounds landing around and near him. Lucas, we have a problem. More so than this? He yelled over the sound of gunfire. The other half of their forces are converged covering the lobby. I believe they think that you'll be making your way down to the exit via the front door. If, even if you get to the stairs, you are outgunned and outnumbered. <sighs> I love good news. So I'm out of options? As far as I can see. Wait! It was Thor who spoke up. I think I have a way for you. You're on the fifth floor, right? Yeah. Good. I've studied the blueprints of this place like you told me. If you get to the if you can get to the second floor, there should be a small laundry chute to the on the hallway. If you can jump in that, it'll take you straight to me. Sounds like a plan. Now for us to get in there, I don't know. His speech was cut off as he began to form another plan in his head. Reese, give me some cover. Of course. What will you do? she asked, unloading a couple of rounds into some hostels. Make make my own stairs. He cocked his gun and pointed it towards the center of the room. Gravita. The round that he fired was small and purple, but expanded to the size of a car. The mass dropped to the floor, punching a hole through. Not wasting another second, he drove he dove through the floor and landed in the room beneath. He fired again creating another gaping hole for him to jump through. With the last round, he repeated the action, giving him the last hole he needed to get to the second floor, thankfully clear of enemies. Dusting himself off, he walked out of the room into the very empty hallway and began to look for the laundry chute. The sounds of gunfire seemed to die down above, meaning they probably knew he wasn't up there anymore. Urgency rushed his search. This is the sounds of stomping footsteps closed in on him. He yanked the rusty hatch chute open, right next to the elevator. He rushed towards it. He cursed himself as he yanked the rusted hatch open. His face scrunched up as he looked down at the dark crevice leading to his next destination. No time to be picky. He popped open the top of the case to see the pup, a bit ruffled, but otherwise okay. Hang on to your tail, kiddo. This next part's gonna suck. The cub didn't have time to wonder what he meant before the lid was shut on him again. Lucas dropped the case down the shaft, hoping that its lone passenger wouldn't have too much of a hard ride. The steps were getting closer. There was no, to really, there was no time to really think. The human jumped headfirst into the chute, not caring about how the rough the trip would be for him. If anyone happened to be next to the chute, they would have probably laughed themselves at the various curses and expletives the 37-year-old human shouted as he bumped and bashed his way down a dark metal shaft, completely at the mercy of gravity. He finally landed with a pronounced thud into an old laundry bin, minus the laundry, which he probably could have used to give him a softer landing. Uh, I don't want to do that again, Mommy. Nice trip you have. Lucas cast a sore glare at the grinning form of his diminutive partner, Thorgan Riffall. Age, 89, in dwarf years. Height, 4 foot 10. Weight, 245 pounds. Eye color, green. 
hair color dirty blonde species dwarf occupation freelancer slash mechanic the dwarf looked no worse for wear considering how he arrived here and such his faded red jacket had spots of dirt and filth patched all over it as was his favorite cap from his favorite baseball team the baltimore saltines his long blue jean shorts had a few rips in them and tears in them more so than normal his favorite blue sneakers were caked in mud and other things i don't think are mud he nevertheless found the effort to smile as cocky as ever even with his blonde goatee in such a rough shaped condition yeah. watch what you say or i'll pull out my old dwarf toffin skills talk 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 lucas climbed out of the bin groaning at the fresh bruises he will more likely have by the time his job was over you got the package? Thorgan gestured to the case next to him. Ah, go a little way before your glorious entrance. Lucas chose to ignore his comment as he popped open the check on his charge. To his relief, the pup was fine and seemingly happy. Oh, look at the little wee one, cooed Thorgan. He's a cute one, isn't he? Ah, oh, it reminds me of me dog back in Roost. Lucas looked, looked at Thor with, Thorgan with horror. Moogie? He reminds you of Moogie? Yes. Moogie is ugly, he said incredulously. Thorgan's beloved dog was a breed known as a Rustian Bulldog, a large, hardy breed of canine known for its size, fierce loyalty, and unquestioned strength. The trade-off was that the Rustian Bulldogs weren't exactly attractive to anyone other than the dwarf. In fact, in a recent poll of the populace, it was found that 76% of the people of the Empire firmly believed that Rusty and Bulldogs was the ugliest breed of dog in the Empire. Moogie is not ugly, Thorgan shot back. He's got character. Reese, even in the midst of sniping, decided to throw in her two cents. Lucas is right. Your dog is ugly as sin, and you should be ashamed of yourself for comparing the two. Oh, you'll be the ugliest sin when you get me hands on your lass. The, t the human sighed to himself as the two began to their one of their usual bickering matches. Enough, you two, massaging the bridge of his nose. Where's Mr. Parker? Thorgan cracked a grin at his question. Over there, he answered, ready and waiting. He caught sight of Mr. Parker leaning next to an old washing machine. In this case, Mr. Parker was not a person. It was a long black bokin, or wooden sword for the uneducated. It was made of a special type of Alaskan cedar oak, very sturdy and thick. In some ways, it was stronger than a regular steel sword. As for the name, Lucas named it after a trainer at the academy, Captain Alex Parker. According to Lucas, the sword was just like him, large, black, and busted heads if you, didn't, if you pissed him off. He took the sword by the white ribbon-covered handle, swinging it around to readjust to its weight. Old friend, it's time to bust heads. So what's the plan now, lad? Asked the dwarf. Getting there. Reese, how's it looking up top? There was a slight pause before she answered, likely taking a hit count of the foes. They are searching downward, but I, but I do not believe they know your exact location as of yet. Groovy. Thor? A party favors are already in set. Gravy. Okay, we need to get up to the lobby and hold out until Gruz gets here. If he says he's coming, he's coming. He he ordered. Reese, you get your elven ass down here. Gonna need you closer when the fun starts. Moving. I got the kid. I got the kid. You ready for this, bud? Thor reached into his ba large backpack and pulled out something that looked like a small black rod. With a twist... It doubled in length to a more recognizable shape of a shotgun. The Mark V Roundhouse Collapsible Shotgun was Thorgan's favorite weapon to use, mainly because it was so much like him, small in size, but packs a punch. Ah, always ready for this lad. He punctuated his answer with a nice, loud cock of his gun. Rowdy, rowdy. You know the way? Just gotta go through the boiler. Just gotta go through the boiler room. Cut through the second laundry, a small hallway, dash through the kitchen, and we're there. Good, you take point. Oh, and your mom was right. 
Just break down and buy a hat. Just get moving, dwarf. The dwarf nodded in agreement and headed for the door of the boiler room. He kicked it open with his small legs and casually walked in. Lucas was about to admonish him for going into a room without properly checking, but it died the moment he followed him in. There were five dead bodies around the room, two humans, three satyrs. Four of them had been shot to death. The fifth one's face had been beaten into an unrecognizable mesh of teeth, bones, horns, blood, and vomit. The rats? asked Lucas. Oh, hi. Dumb big ones, too. The duo passed over the bodies and into the small hallway that led to the kitchen. This was one of the few rooms in the whole building that was still active to provide meals for Stripe's growing army. Neither of them knew this, but they would print. They would have predicted the presence of three more satyrs, snacking out some bread. Said bread was dropped as they caught sight of the duo and aimed their guns. Ah, oh, bloody hell! shouted Thor, as the two of them dove behind. <coughs> dove behind a counter. With a hail of bullets rain over them. Through the noise, Lucas could hear the sounds of one of them radioing for backup. Things were about to get crowded. Setting down the case, he drew his fully loaded revolver and unloaded a few rounds at them. Thor piped, popped off a few rounds with his shotgun while shouting like an insane madman. Come on, you bastards! I have better aim when I'm taking a piss! He roared between shots. This is what Lucas referred to as Thor's insult foo. During fights like this, he would often shout, curse, throw insults, and generally just do anything he can to piss off his opponents. In his words, an angry enemy is a sloppy enemy, and a sloppy enemy is a dead enemy. Lucas could almost laugh at the other insane things the dwarf was yelling between shots. Come on, you horse! Get your balls up! My granny can shoot better than a lot of you, and she's dead! Why don't you get your mothers to shoot for you? Oh, wait, she can't! She's too tired for me giving it to her last night! You son of a bitch! One of the satyrs roared, much to Thor's delight. Giving in to his rage, the man rushed out and charged straight at them. Thor popped over the counter and shot him full of buckshot, dropping him stone dead. Just as Lucas was reloading, one of the satyrs rushed over to get a bead on him point blank. Reacting quickly, he chopped the gun out of, the, out of his hands, but lose, uh, lost a grip on his own. The satyr jacked him against the wall in a violent chokehold. Thor would have helped him too, but the other satyr was on him, and his shotgun was dry. What now, you little mouth midget? Thor said nothing before sliding a riot baton out of his sleeve of his jacket and cracking him in the knee. The offender groaned in pain as he dropped to his knees and into Thor's range. The dwarf smashed his jaw with a right cross. He followed up with a knee strike to the nose, putting him down for the good. Lucas had his hands full with his own foe, losing oxygen fast from his grip. Desperate, he grabbed one of the horns and snapped it off. Mind-numbing pain, the satyr dropped him before staggering back. Taking the chance, he stabbed the beast with its own horn in the chest, killing it stone dead. He coughed for a bit, trying to catch his breath as he holstered his gun and retrieved the sword and case. He looked over at Thor, reloading his gun. They nodded at each other before heading towards the exit. Lucas caught sight of two men coming up to the door. He flew over with a kick, knocking the door off its hinges and onto the two. One was out cold, the other tried to get up. Lucas silenced him with a quick slash of Mr. Parker. Not missing a beat, he ran down the hallway. It was when he ran at the corner. It's when he ran at the corner that he noticed that his little friend was missing. Just as he was about to call out to him, the dwarf scuttled around the corner, shotgun in hand. What kept you? Oh, do you know? The sound of an approaching mob around the corner filled their ears. Lucas would have drawn his gun for a firefight, only for the mob to be taken out by a massive explosion. Rat traps! Thor smiled as he ran ahead. Lucas shook his head as he followed him right behind. 
After a few frantic minutes of running, they found themselves in what could be called the employee break room. Fortunately, it was empty. Lucas peeked out at the door, which he saw were their destination. The lobby wasn't as crowded as it originally was when he entered, but there were still ten very trigger-happy men lounging around, muttering to each other about what they do when they to that fucker Kane. Huh. A lot of rats in there, he reported to his partner. Oh, got something for that lad. Thorgan reached into his seemingly bottomless backpack and pulled out a very nasty-looking grenade. A ripper? Lucas said. This is gonna suck for them. Thorgan took a position on the opposite side of the door from Lucas. The human grabbed the knob while the dwarf grasped the pin of the grenade. Trek! Trek! Unsk! He counted in dwarfish. At zero, he pulled the pin and opened the door for Thorgan to throw the explosive into the lobby. Shutting it fast, they took cover behind the door as the men gathered in... in men gathered, the questioned men gathered what the hell this small object was that came out of thin air. I doubt they had time to realize the danger they were in before it exploded. The blast blew the door off its hinges and onto the floor. There were thousands of small spears embedded in the wood... As they looked out into the chaos, they saw that all the men on the ground were on the ground, either dead or in extreme pain from the multitude of spear shrapnel. They learned why Thorgan called it a ripper grenade. The duo walked into the painful mayhem they had created, stepping over the dead and dying bodies of their foes. Well, that was a lot easier than I... Lucas' statement was cut off by the arrival of five more goons. Ah, oh, shit! With bullets whizzing past them, they launched themselves behind the former sign-in desk. Lucas cursed as he realized he was out of ammo when he tried to fire back. I'm out! He yelled at over the cacophony of gunfire. Here! The dwarf tossed him a small sack of variable rounds before taunting and firing at their aggressors. Opting not to use both guns, he only reloaded one before joining in on the gun battle. He dropped three more with fire rounds next to Thorgan's four with his shotgun. Sadly, their kills weren't doing much as they were getting back, backed up from more men from the stairs. By the time Lucas had emptied his gun, there were now 14 gunmen firing on their position. The firing had gotten so fierce that both of them couldn't re even return fire without taking a shot or two themselves. Thinking we'd be in a tough spot of trouble, eh, Luke? Thor yelled over the gunfire. Nah, all part of the plan, he replied. He reloaded his revolver, ready to take down a few more punks, until the wave of bullets came to an end. The two men shared a look before they peeked over the counter. In front of the mob was Elias Strife, dirty and holding a bloody nose. He was not in a very good mood. Mr. Kane, he roared. Gone was the civilized and elegant criminal mastermind. He was hurting, embarrassed, Shamed and absolutely livid. Hey, buddy! And Lucas was going to make him all the more unhinged. Looks like you ain't having a good night. I have to admit, Mr. Kane, he angrily spat. That was a very bold tactic you employed. You killed most of my men, disrupted my operations, destroyed my desk, and broke my nose! It's a bit of an improvement. I'd admire you for your bravado if I wasn't so infuriated, but I'm willing to give you some measure of mercy if you return what's mine. Your pride? He yelled back. Nah, you lost that a long time ago, sunshine. The boy! What little patience Strife had was quickly running out. Give me the boy! Lucas chuckled to himself. <laughs> the boy was never yours, asshole. I can't give you back what you never had. The elf boss snorted as he snapped his fingers. On command, a set of thunderous footsteps heralded the arrival of the one being in the whole building Lucas did not want to have to deal with personally. The cave troll walked right up to Strife, club in hand, and looked very ready to commit murder. You have one minute, Mr. Kane, to return the boy to me, or I send this troll over to rip you and that dirty little dwarf to pieces. Thorgan popped up. I'll just charge your pawns. I'll rip your ball, his balls off and feed him to him. Then that's after I ram your head up as your big green arse. 
Lucas gave a loud, taunting belly laugh. <laughs> I'm gonna have to agree with him. No dice. It was the elf's turn to laugh, almost incredulously. <laughs> you really think you can win this? You're outnumbered. Outgunned. I have more men upstairs, and lest you forget, a cave troll. What do you have? It seems the gods wanted to say they were sorry for earlier. For just as he finished that question, something large and heavy slammed into the ceiling. The sounds of small arms fire and horrifying screams filtered into the room. The men upstairs seemed to be fright fighting something and losing. With each passing second, the screams got louder and more frantic and fewer in number. Mixed into this were the sounds of something roaring and growling in some kind of language that neither Strife nor his men could understand. All the while, they were frozen in morbid fascination and exciting fear. No! was yelled before a body of a satyr crashed through the ceiling and landed on the ground in a mangled heap. The screaming was louder now, as the sounds of bodies and furniture being thrown about the rooms above. Behind the mob, another body crashed through the same manner. The sickening sounds of bone breaking echoed through the room. Just then, a human scrambled out of the first hole, desperately trying to seek safety from the Armageddon that was happening up there. Just as it seemed like he would escape, his face screwed into one of absolute horror. No! I've got no place! He begged as he was dragged back up. His screams were silenced by what sounded like his body being broken, for lack of a better term. Then, there was nothing. The screams died out. The only sounds were left were heavy breathing and stomping footsteps. Before anyone could say anything, the ceiling in front of the sign-in desk crashed down. In the, in the form of the rubble arose a mass of fur and bloodlust. What do we have? Lucas smiled widely. We have Gru's. This mountain of mayhem was Gru's. Age undetermined. Height eight foot seven. Weight five hundred and sixty six pounds. Eye color gold. Hair color matted brown. Species Sasquatch. Occupation freelancer slash professional ass kicker the mob of men shrunk back in surprise and fear at the titan before them it's understandable of course anyone who first meets grooves can find him most intimidating his fur covered face was hard and stern golden eyes full of violence his bottom canine teeth stuck up and out of his large mouth, one of which was chipped, which seemed to add to his imposing presence. His hair covered his broad chest and long, thick forearms that looked like they could shrug off a missile strike. The only bit of clothing he wore was a pair of blue jean shorts that didn't seem to really fit him. On his back was something that looked like a long rifle. But why someone like this guy would need a weapon, they would never know. What took you so long? asked Lucas. Tachamai Muchi Hamashina. Now your eyes are not messing with you. That is the language of the Sasquatch called Sasquitch. It is a rough and complex tongue which almost everyone in the Empire, including myself, can understand. If that's true, then why do I not translate it for you? Well, it's quite simple. They don't like others to really speak it. There's nothing to do with Sasquatches not wanting other races to speak it. It's just to them, anyone else who speaks it sounds horrible, stinted, and mangled. Even the best linguists in the New World can't properly speak Sasquatch to save their lives. Instead, it's just easier for everyone if people merely understood the language but not speak it. And since Sasquatches can understand a lot of languages, there was no need for them to ever deviate from their own. You were doing that again, weren't you? Lucas said. Nanema! Matachika! He pleaded almost like a child would be before an angry parent. He's lying, Thorgan chimed in. 
He was doing that again. Not Emma! Not Emma! You're gonna catch something if you keep doing that. While the trio were busy discussing Bruce's personal habits, the mob were frozen in fear, save for Stripe and his cave troll. What are you fools doing? He said. Get them! But his orders fell on deaf ears. His men, the baddest he could find, were just stone statues before the form of Groose. But... That's Groose, one of them said. Yeah, I heard about him. He, he, he's the one who messed up those guys over at the Great Lakes, another said. I heard about that. They said he killed so many of them that the lake was blood red for a week. The terror amongst them was, all, it was at an all-time high. They had heard the stories and rumors about this guy. They know what would happen, what, what could happen to people who got on the wrong side of Groose. What they didn't know was that he was one of uh, was on Lucas's payroll. The only one who didn't know the stories was Stripe himself. He's just a hairy ape, he raged. There's nothing to fear. We had 20 guys up there, all armed to the teeth. And he killed them all. Boss, let's let this go. Let that let him go. I don't want to get ripped apart. The morale of his men was shrinking and dying right before his eyes. Anyone else who knew the stories would have taken the, that advice and gotten as far away from this murder machine as possible. Sadly, Elias Stripe wasn't anyone else. Eyes filled with indignation, he merely snapped his fingers at the troll. Go! Kill! That was all a troll needed to hear. Like I said, they weren't very smart, but when told to kill, they killed. The mass of green smiled a disgusting, slobbery smile as he began to advance. Lucas was the first to notice this. Think you can handle him, old buddy? He gestured at, it, at his head towards the troll. Groose stretched out his jaw, cracked his neck, and rotated his shoulder a little bit. Jay, he replied before heading off to meet his opponent. Now I feel the need to tell you that a Sasquatch versus a cave troll is a mismatch against the Sasquatch. Trolls were bigger and stronger than any Sasquatch. In fact, a troll versus a Sasquatch is no more a fair fight than a troll versus a human. But then again, this is Groose we are talking about. The two titans stomped towards each other, neither showing any signs of backing down until they were inches apart. The troll had at least two feet on him, and another 200 pounds over him. It was one of the few times Groose actually had to look up at a foe. But even as the troll snarled at him, slobber oozing from its mouth, Groose was unmoved. There wasn't a single speck of fear, doubt, or intimidation in his eyes or body. All that was coming from him was a strong urge to beat respect into this creature. Shuma shimate, neche hachmos shi archufak belar. He threatened, or at least that's why I assume it was a threat, jabbing his finger into his skin. The troll, neither caring nor understanding what he just said, simply reeled his massive open left hand back and hit him with something that was less of a slap and more of an open handed punch. The shock of the blow was enough to shake the windows and rumble the ground. Stripe smiled smugly at the results of his investment. I mean, such a blow could kill a vampire, lichen, or human. Then again, this is Groose we're talking about. Not only was he still alive, he wasn't even off his feet. His body was just leaning over from the force of the hit. He slowly righted his posture, rubbing the side of his face as he did. He merely nodded before speaking. Shalmita! Before anyone could blink, Groose tackled the troll, full speed, pushing him back towards the mob. The men scattered out of the way as the hairy beast began to lay in with haymakers to its body. The troll countered with a giant swing of its club, but Groose ducked it, countered, countering with some quick jabs to its massive gut. It swung its club again. This time, Groose caught it with his one hand and gave his forearm a nice little punch. The blow caused it to lose its grip on the weapon, which was now in Groose's hairy hands. Taking one look at the club, 
Groot shook his head and snapped it in two like a toothpick before he punched it in the face. The troll staggered back, hurt and shocked, while the Sasquatch melee advanced upon him, ready to dish out more punishment. I could only imagine the troll's thought process at this moment. This particular troll had always thought it was pretty damn tough, having survived the outwiles of Australia for all of its life. Dozens of trolls and goblins and other things that humans didn't even know existed tried to take it. They all failed. Nothing was as strong as it. Then there was this small, hairy thing, this gruse. It was beating it so easily. It was unthinkable for it. He was bigger. He should be winning. It was around this time that both the troll and strife finally started to understand why the men were so damn scared of him. This is what it meant to face the strongest and most notorious Sasquatch in the Empire. This is what violence and pain and death look like. This was Groos. Kill them. Kill them all. Kill the brute. Kill the dwarf. Kill Kane. Kill them all! It took a few seconds before his raging order to register with his men. Those few seconds were all that a certain sniper really needed. Before the first goon raised its gun, an impact round dropped him like a swatted fly. The next muttered a half curse word before it met the same fate. As more of them started dropping, Lucas and Thorgan took the opportunity to resume the gunfight, and thanks to the panic from watching Groose utterly destroy their strongest member, the mob was in complete disorder. Shotgun rounds and fire shots cut down the men to ribbons, and while Strife took cover behind a convenient pillar, Elias Strife, ninth son of Albus Strife, watched as months of planning and bargaining were going up in smoke. His money was non-existent. His men were either dead dying or maimed, and its greatest investment, the cave troll, was being beaten within an inch of its life. This was the end of its ambitions, all because of a human. His thought process was interrupted by pieces of a, the pillar explode, erupting into his face, a result of a fire round from the gun of the aforementioned human. Stony shrapnel temporarily blinded him. As he rolled around the ground in pain, he, bar he barely could make out over his own painful groans the final death rattles of his cave troll as Groose punched it in his face of his, into a green blob of gore. After a minute or so, the battle had ended. Most of his men were dead, and those who weren't probably wished they were. Groose gave the troll one last punch before roaring in triumph over his victory. Oi, Groose, me lad! Thorgan said, walking over to his large friend. I do love watching your work. The Sasquatch just smiled sheepishly at the comment. Shasha, me no na chicha. Ah, don't be so modest. After this light, we'll hit up a pub, and we'll get a point. Sound good? Che. Strife, his vision now cleared up, crawled over to one of his deceased minion's guns, hoping to lay out a shot at his hated foe. All he got for his efforts was a shattered hand as Mr. Parker impacted on it. He howled in pain as Lucas stood over him. Uh-uh, he said. No gun for you tonight. The elf clutched his hand, tears streaming down its dusty face. You liar! You said you wouldn't stop me! This wasn't part of your job! You're supposed to exchange the kid for the money! Lucas leaned down close to him. Yeah, I kind of lied about that particular part. What? I wasn't lying when I said I always follow through on a job I'm given. The thing I lied about was the job itself. You see, my job wasn't exact wasn't to exchange 50 million drachmas for my employer's kid. It was to get the kid back and put you and everyone else involved in the kidnapping in the ground. This... This was a hit! Strife never thought of this possibility, that the parents would actually hire Kane just to kill him. Of course, dumbass! exclaimed Le Lucas. You kidnapped a lichen cub. Did you honestly think that a lichen family was just gonna let you off the hook for taking their kid? 
Shit. You're lucky they didn't decide to send a full death pack after you. They do far worse to you than we would have done. So, what now? The elf asked. Well, the family doesn't know what we know. Your name, your face, your family. It's all us. So I'll cut you a deal. What kind of deal? You go back to your little life. Back to your mansion, back to your money, back to your family. And you forget about doing this ever again. I go back to my bosses and say every last person involved in the kidnapping of their son is dead. Take the deal, or I have Groose come over and crush your head like a grape. Strife cast an eye to Groose, grinning menacingly and striking his fist with his open hand. After all the chaos that these people wrought upon him, he believed it. Any one of them could kill him right now, and there was nothing he could do about it. If I were you, lad, I'd take it, added Thorgan. I... I agree. The human grinning at the acceptance of, uh, as he straightened himself out. Good! You're a smart guy. Now we shall take the kid and our leave. Oh, you might want to call an ambulance for these guys. Well, the ones that are still alive. He turned on his heel. He said turn on his heel. Okay, boys. Let's not keep our dear sniping waiting. Let the harpy wait, exclaimed Thorgan. Thorgan! Dursha shisha! Rishesita mesha! Groose said, causing the dwarf to laugh loudly. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Oh, Groose, you have a dirty mind, and that's why I love you. Case in hand, Lucas joined his partners and strolled out of the but bullet ridden bombed-out lobby and into the night air. Now, normally, any reasonable person would just walk away and do nothing more. Then we have Elvish Pride. Greater than regular old pride. Elvish pride is more powerful and dangerous. Elvish pride can overwhelm an elf's normally logical brain and make them do something incredibly stupid when they feel they've been wronged by someone who they would consider beneath them. This is what Elias Strife was feeling at the moment. His entire operation had been utterly wrecked by a human, a dwarf, and a sasquatch. His mind told him to let them go, but his pride was screaming at him to teach them a lesson. His pride moved him to, to his feet, scrambling for a weapon, and picked up an assault rifle from one of his with his one good hand. You know, good maggots, I will be the new master of crime. I will not be assaulted like this. He struggled with the gun since he only had one really good hand, but he was adjusting well enough. Halfway across the lot. Thorgan nudged Lucas a bit. Look, he said, drawing his attention to the very stupid elf who was about to make a very stupid decision. I know, he answered casually. Party starter. The, Luke, the dwarf reached into his pocket and handed him a small remote. Lucas Kane! The injured elf screamed. Turn around! I want you to see who kills you! Said human merely sighed to himself muttering something about the stupidity of some people. Strife halfway cocked the gun with his good hand when Lucas raised up the remote. Hey, sunshine, he called out. Enjoy the fireworks. Click. That was all that was needed to seal Elias Strife's fate. The entire building shook, shook with the copious amounts of explosives that Thorgan had laid about the supports detonated. I'm not sure what went through his mind before he was consumed by the flames. Maybe I'm thinking maybe I'm maybe thinking back on how that having a meager allowance wasn't so bad. Or seeing his brothers and sister one more time. I wouldn't know. All I know is that the young elf was swallowed up by the billowing balls of fire from beneath him. Probably regretting his foolish choice to test Lucas Kane and his crew. By the time the trio had left the lot, the hotel was nothing more than a fiery pile of rubble, burning in the night. Damn, Lucas marveled. That really blowed up good. All oh, right, some of my best work, said a proud Thorgan. Maybe you should have gone a light on the C6, bud. Oh, yeah, and maybe Gruz, he, me and Gruz here will wear nice pretty pink dresses and have a tea party with our dollies. Gruz laughed along with Thorgan's joke. 
it would certainly be an improvement over your current state. Reese Foe made her presence known as she strolled out of an alley nearby, still covered in her camel cloak, whisper in right hand. Oh, the elfish bitch has jokes, Thor teased. More than what you have, half-man, she fired back, removing her hood to let her long purple hair flow in the breeze. Seshima! Reese pointed a finger at the Sasquatch. Do not encourage him. Her threat seemed to work as Gru shrank back a little. Guys, can we not do this now? Lucas spoke up at, onto his team. We gotta get out of here before the cops get here. I really don't feel like answering why I blew up an old building in their town. The others nodded with his reason. He set the black case down and popped it open. Besides, he started as he pulled out the happy and safe little pup. We gotta get this little guy back home. Shy, 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 the hairy giant cooed at the sight of the little one. Even the Ice Queen herself couldn't help but crack a smile at the chipper yapping of the pup. He is pretty cute. For a lichen. Ah, you can do better than that. He's a mighty cute one for anything, Thorgan added, scratching behind his ear. Let's move out, people. Jinx is probably going to go and stir crazy for us back on the Howard. Without a word, the dwarf, elf, and Sasquatch followed their leader as he, with pup in hand, walked down the street, hopefully able to catch a bus to the airport without anyone asking too many questions as to why they were armed as such. This was their team, and why I enjoy watching them. Bicker as they may, with their strange habits and quirks, theirs was a team built of respect, trust, and friendship. This unique bond was the main reason why they were able to succeed as well as they do, and why they were the best in the Empire. Green! What's up, Bruce? Cheshima, Machi, Chuchu, Komatecha Chaka, he said, motioning his hand over his head. Not you, too! Even he thinks so. You need a hat, lad. Possibly a bowler. Or a fedora. I do not need a friggin' hat! Or a sombrero. You could put it off, lad. Or how about a top hat? Sante Chesama! That could work, too. That's it! I've had it. You're all fired. We get back, turn in your keys, and get out. But you did not give us keys, Lucas Kane. Then I'll have someone make keys, give them to you, and then you can turn them in. Happy? End of chapter.